Okay, well, welcome to those who may be watching by way of the stream, and I hope tonight this will work. I have prepared two in two ways, so uh, if I can do it this way, and I think I can. Oh, if you've got the handout, Cosmic Tower of Babel, that's where we need to be. And we've got those, I think, on the table over here if you don't have one. And uh, all I need to know is if you can read that, and it looks like you can. So if you can read it, it'll work. And if I can do this, it will be so much easier than having to put all this in PowerPoint. Because in PowerPoint, you have to put it in a slide. I, there, there are a couple of things that we've studied that are, are pivotable. It's, it's where the pendulum swings. And for those who may be watching by way of the stream, if we, we, uh, I'd be happy to try to email you if you contact church office or uh, I think we're, I think, are we going out on Facebook or YouTube? YouTube. YouTube. And so I'm not sure about, the, I'm, I'm not computer savvy to tell you those who are watching how we can get you back and forth, but we got four handouts. One we introduced last week and we're going to go back to it in a moment. But the information that, that uh, we're going to study tonight is the foundation for the other three angel studies. And so I hope that you'll, you'll look at that with us and uh, you, you can follow along on your handout. That's, that's kind of what my goal is to, uh, to be able to show it to you. And uh, if I can, here we go, got my pointer. We can... Uh, maybe uh, answer questions at the same time give you a source because if you're like I am much of what we've studied I still find a bit overwhelming uh, to, to be able to think and, and uh, well to change our view we all have a, a view uh, my world view for the most part would have been framed here in the southeast and then in, in the Bible Belt, here within the Southeast, and in our communities, because I grew up in a small community, rural area, grew up on a farm. And so my worldview would have been different from those who grew up maybe in the inner cities of Atlanta, New York, Los Angeles, or some major metro area. I mean, the worldview there, a lot different than the worldview I had. And, and then, then my, my first trip to Israel back in 1977, and it just took my worldview and blew it all apart. And, and the first shock that I had was that when I got to Israel and we went to the Temple Mount, and here we're standing by the wall that's called early on, I, I heard it as a Wailing Wall, then it's now the, they call it the Western Wall. And the reason they call it the Wailing Wall prior to 67 the Jews were not permitted to go to the wall except by some real, real, real special permission. And it was only a little alley. And when they'd go, they mourned for Jerusalem. And that's why they called it the Wailing Wall. And now that they have Jerusalem, uh, it's, a, it's addressed as the Western Wall. Though I have heard the wailing at the wall by some of the older saints who, who come to pray. And, and there is a site, if you do the tunnel walk, and several of you have been with me and you have, you, you get to a spot where it's believed to be the closest you could get to what it would have been the Holy of Holies. And there, there's a synagogue. And most of the time that I've been, it, it's the ladies that I've seen there at the wall praying. And uh, they're, of course, are praying for the Messiah to come. That's their, that's their passion. But, but let's go, go back, back to, to here. I think that getting beyond the fact that in Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, and then again we see in verse 4, but 1 and 2 was originally in one statement, and we, it's in two verses, but the sons of God, and that proposed a couple of possibilities, maybe three. Either the sons of God were fallen angels, B'nai Elohim is in the Hebrew. Or, as some taught, the descendants of Seth. But the basis upon Seth was that he was a righteous man. And we're going to touch on some of that in a little bit. So that was an option. 
and it would have been the sons of Seth married the daughters of Cain. And that produces this giant race that in the Hebrew you see the word Nephilim as being the descendants, the children. And then the, the, the third position uh, is kind of fuzzy for some, but that these were men of renown. You know, kind of like a, I, I always pictured it as a mythological figure or a great world ruler. Uh, if we put it in a, a modern framework, we might say someone like Nebuchadnezzar or someone like Alexander the Great, uh, who was a person of renown. And uh, so one of those three. Well, if you're just going to go by Bible, because you'll find sons of God again in John 1, 12, you see it in 1 John, you see it and just a number of other references, there's just more Bible that it's sons of God, meaning there were fallen angels, not counting the text in Peter and the text in Jude, which says in Jude they left their first habitation. They left their estate in heaven when they lusted after the daughters of men. So that was a hurdle. I had to kind of finally find my uh, spiritual feet that I could... Uh, well, I guess I had to grow enough in my faith to accept how big God is. You see, God created everything. If that's true, you can nod your head or say something. God is all-powerful. And, and, and everything consists by Him. He holds it together. So regardless... Of whatever explanation we find in, in, in Genesis 6, it doesn't change anything. God's still God. And he's still in control. But if we look for a reason for the flood, and that's why we look in Genesis 6, why did God destroy the world with a flood? Then we kind of got to know it was more than just meanness or evil. Now, we have witnessed in our nation in the last few days a horrendous act in Pittsburgh. I mean, this had a man stop me today. I was at Bilo's picking up some medication, and he saw my lanyard with Christians United for Israel, and he came over and began talking to me about how terrible that act was in Pittsburgh, and how could somebody have that much hate in them. I mean, one of the ladies was a 97-year-old, and, and to just go in and ruthlessly shoot and kill 11 people. I mean, it's just it's unimaginable. But that's a day we live is a day of evil. But as I read in whatever happened before the flood, it's a lot worse than this. And according to Matthew 24, uh, a sign, when the disciples asked the Lord for a sign, he said, like the days of, of Noah. So we're going to see a repeat of the evil that was on earth before the flood and it's going to be before the return of Christ, because that's what the question was about his second coming. What I didn't understand was some of the things that makes everything turn. And this is where I believe tonight you'll say, this has helped me to have a better understanding of it. So if, you, if you'll notice the intro in the first paragraph says, this passage, along with Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9. Now the passage... We're going to back it up in a moment, and we're going to see in, in Genesis, the 10th chapter, where you've got the table of nations, and that's where the, there was an allotment made of land, but it wasn't described then. We'll, we'll, we'll look at, at the ins and outs on that in just a bit. Look with me at this next statement. He refers to Paul. He talks about Paul's theology of the unseen world. Well, I'm afraid I have to make a confession that my theology on the unseen world was extremely anemic. I mean, I, I believed, but I knew very little about what I believed. And I was almost, uh, oh, if you'd ask me a real technical questions about angels, I might fess up and just say, well, I don't know. More than likely, I might try to give you an educated guess. But it's great to open the Word of God and see what the Bible says. And that's what this study has been about. We just looked in the Bible to see what the Bible says. And uh, having said that, but here's where you see the foundation. 
He says it is the foundation of false theology. It was all here. It was built on something we don't see. And then he goes on and, and refers to Acts 17, 26 through 27. And here's the text in the ESV. And I believe I didn't do this, but I need to. And I think I can. So bear with me for a second. Uh, I thought I had pre preloaded this and I didn't. So I need to run both of these at the same time. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Right here. Okay. Now, now we're good. We're good. I think this will work for me. Now, let's look together. I referred to Genesis 10, 25 a moment ago. Here's the text. Look at this. Now, we're talking. We see this foundation in Genesis 10. And this is at the tower. This is where the languages were, were introduced and people were scattered. But this little phrase right here never registered with me. All the readings through the Bible, all the studies on Genesis, all the sermons I've heard, uh, studies, I, I mean, I took several courses on the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible, and, and, and the flood was a highlight topic. We studied about the flood, but not in the depth that I should have. In verse 25 of Genesis 10, look at this, and unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. Now look at this next phrase. I put it in red. Look at, look at this. For in his days was the earth, what's this word? Divided. And he goes on to say his brother's name was Jotun. But here, the, the earth was divided. What does that mean, divided? You know, my first impulse would be to see the continents. You know, prior to the flood, there were no oceans. After the flood, there was oceans. So, you know, from just a physiological standpoint, just, just the physical mass of, of the earth, that would have been my first impression. But context, no. So we got, we got to go to Deuteronomy 32. And look with me, please, in verse 7. We're reviewing the verse, and then we're going to see, I believe, a, an application that will help us. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 7, the Bible says, remember the days of old. Well, if you go back prior to the flood, that's pretty old. If you go, if you go back to there. And then he goes on to say this. Consider the years of many generations. And then here's a big word. Ask thy fathers, and he will show thee thy elders, and they will tell thee. Now, here's what registers with me. In most of our, call it New Testament, call it church, call it church age or whatever training we have. Uh, I've mentioned this a few times at many of the courses. We did not go into in-depth studies in the Old Testament. In depth. I mean, where you really look at word meanings and how it applies and what do you see in the Bible background for, for that event. It was all kind of kind of hit and, and, and a bit of a topical category. And when he said, you, you got to notice this now, ask thy fathers. And then he goes on to say, and, and the father will show you. Well, how can the father show it? How much of what we've talked about in the last... X number of months. If children ask us, what does that mean? We could give them an answer. Is that important? Yep. Is that people all the time? Well, why do you study this? Well, apparently, that's how God got it started. But they had an answer. And he goes on to say, thy elders, they will tell thee. So it wasn't just the fathers. The elders would have been the spiritual leadership. So these are questions that it shouldn't just be limited to a father or the pastor, but the laypersons of the church should have an answer. And I think maybe when it comes to the difficult issues of life that we're now facing in this modern age, and, and young people do come to us with, with questions. I'm afraid either our answers are too anemic 
or maybe too academic, or maybe too fuzzy, that the kids leaving, they leave after we've answered and they don't, they feel, oh, I don't know any more than if I ask. But he said, if, we're, if it's not something, and it's taken me over two years to get close to my comfort zone. But I can promise this, I never went anywhere outside of the scriptures. It's all in the Bible. It's all there. Deuteronomy 32 has been there. Now go a little further with me. He says, in this context, verse 8, and in, 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 in verse 8, uh, well, i got to hit the button. Verse 8 says, look at verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. Who are the nations? We saw in, in, in Genesis 10, 25, when, when, when it was divided. And we'd have to come back with some conclusion at some point, and I believe we will tonight, when he says, uh, they divided to the nations their inheritance, and he separated the sons of Adam, and he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Now, if you, if you look at the older manuscripts, and this is what the ESV is based on, it's the Greek Septuagint. And, and it's translated as we'll see it. Now, here's a reason for it. We'll talk about this in more depth in a moment. But look in verse 8 again. For the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance when he divided mankind. Now, sons of Adam would be mankind. We're not talking about angels here. We're talking about the sons of Adam. And then look what he says next. He fixed. This is the translation. He fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Now, what's the difference between sons of God, sons of Israel? That's what we, if you remember back in, in the King James, it says in that last phrase, when he separated the sons of Adam, which would be, be the uh, mankind, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. The problem and, and, and that's based on Genesis 10.25. Genesis 10.25, there were no sons of Israel. That doesn't happen until you get to the 12th chapter. The call of Abraham. Abraham is a father of our faith. He's a father of the Jews. And since he's a father of the Jews, then the children of Israel are, are traced back to Abraham. So if, if we try to make it fit, and that's what some did, it, it, it just, you know, that, that felt comfortable for them. But I think, I think that, that the most practical explanation would be when it comes to the sons of God. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at another verse. And uh, this time we're going to look at verse 9. This is in Deuteronomy 32 still. Verse 9 says, For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, is the lot of his inheritance. Now, I went and, and put the verse in for you. Genesis, not Deuteronomy, Genesis 32, 28 says, And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but what? Israel. For as a prince, as thy power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Now, how big is that? Well, if, unless, you, unless you're looking in some context, it just might be an academic terminology for a name like Israel, the name change. Now, the relevance for us, for over 2,000 years, there was no nation called Israel. That happened May 14th, 1948. And if you were alive, May 14th, 1948, you witnessed what's, ta what's in this text. If you're, if you're alive then, that date, because that, we're witness to it. Now, why is that relevant? Well, Israel's been scattered. There were more than one tribe in Israel. And one of the big debates, if you remember, we were there last in 15. Who was with me in 15? I know Charles was with us in 15. Earl was with us in 15. And, and yes, yes, uh, Joan and John were with us. We went to the site. 
were David Van Gurion when they declared the independence. May 14, 1948. We were in the assembly. We were there where it took place. And, and, but one of the big debates, what will we call this new nation? What flag will we identify with? And, and it's like Ron tells me, you know, what do you have when three Jews get together? And he said three opinions. And, and, and so it's kind of like Baptist. You just imagine for a moment now, you're on the eve of this, you're declaring your country as a free nation, what are you going to call it? There was not, other than through the tribes, if you go back, you get the divided kingdoms, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, you get the, the, the tribe of Judah, which is primarily around Jerusalem, and, and yet they said Israel. Israel. And that's what we see here in Genesis 32, 28, when God changed the name of Jacob to Israel. And then you got to look back in verse 9. Look, look back at verse 9 now of Deuteronomy 32. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, which is Israel, is the lot of his inheritance. Meaning God said, this is mine. This promised land that I told Abraham to come to, this is mine. This is my land. That's why it's the Holy Land. And, 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 and the name is Israel for God's chosen people and for God's chosen land. And, and so if we, if we just, you know, sometimes our study of Scripture is like a puzzle. We pick a piece up over here. We try to make it fit here. Sometimes, sometimes it will. Sometimes it won't. My temptation is to get a pair of scissors and trim it. The only problem is when we get to where I really need that piece, I don't have it. And, and so we get in a hole. But here we, we can begin to see what God did. And then the realization, if we witness the rebirth of Israel in 1948, what day do we live? You see, that can only be a fulfillment in the end times. And, and that ought to cause all of us kind of look up a little bit. But the fact that God says, this is mine now. Now these other, you know, the world's being divided. And they're divided with powers. The, and we're going to look at that in a moment. So don't, don't turn it off yet. Now, you've got to go further. Go to Acts 17. It's all, now what I'm giving you is in that handout. But I want to put this in the PowerPoint so where I need to put in a verse, I could. And then we're going to go back to, to, to the handout a little bit. But look with me in Acts 17. We alluded to it earlier. And, and Paul is speaking. And look in verse 26. And hath made of one blood. How many nations? All nations. Look. All nations of men for to dwell all, on all the face of the earth. How much? Oh, see a lot of people argue today that much of prophecy is only going to pertain to the Middle East. But that's not according to Scripture. When he says all the face of the earth, that's all the face of the earth. And then he goes on to say, and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their what? Habitation. So he's talking about people living in certain geographical areas. And it all relates back. And Paul is confirming Genesis 10:25. Deuteronomy 32, and there are other texts, but these uh, are, 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 I think, the clearest. And then if you'll look with me in verse 27, look what he says. That they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him. Now look at this last statement. Though he be not far from every one of us. Now, if you've done the study... You've seen some things, and that's in, in this book. It's in this book, The Supernatural. And, and, and it's really an unseen, it's really in this book, in, in more depth. But he talks, he gets three examples. You remember he talked about the name of the leper? And after he was healed, to go back to Syria? What do you want to take? He took two donkey loads of dirt. 
Why? David, when he was running from Saul, complained to God that he wasn't where God's land was. He was in the land of the Philistines, pagan gods and these others. And he wanted to return to, to Israel, to the Holy Land. Remember Moses on Mount Sinai. What did God tell him? Take off your shoes. At the burning bush, take off your shoes. Why? You're standing on what? What makes it holy? It's God's land. Now, I always thought it was because God's presence was there. But no, this is God's land. This is God's portion. This is that portion given to Jacob, which is Israel. And so when we begin to give it some geographical identification with specific boundaries and borders and places, and God says, this is mine. And then we begin to understand their powers and principalities, the rulers of darkness, the prince of darkness, that they have jurisdictions in other areas. All aren't bad. But oh my, in this modern era, I'd want to say it this way, when ISIS was running rampant through the Middle East and especially in Syria and Africa, I'd say there's some pretty bad gods up over those areas. Now, wouldn't you? Yeah. And I think you go to cities and you feel evil when you, you park your car. Somebody mentioned having been on Bourbon Street and, and, and seeing what was there and feeling evil in other places. Can we just stop and consider that maybe the reason we feel it is because it is? I mean, it is. Or maybe you come up on, you know, on some, just some terrible act. And, and you look around and, and, and you just, just get this bad feeling. And, and you sense the presence of evil. We have to factor it in. That's the whole point of our study. Right, let's do it this way. I know that both Paul and Brother Kent have built, been real strong on the whole arm of God. I mean, I got from Paul a medallion, and Kent gave me a set of pens about the whole armor of God. We know in Ephesians 6, verse 10, Be strong in the Lord, the power of his might, and we're told to put on the whole armor of God. Now, why? Because we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against what's the word? Powers, uh, principalities, authorities. You, you, that, that's where the war is. But I don't know that I was as consciously aware as I should have been. Vance Havner preached a sermon years ago. Great, he's one of my heroes. And he entitled the sermon, Getting Used to the Dark. Came out of the mountains, up around Pilot Mountain, North Carolina. But this is country mountainous as you can be. But went to Moody Bible Institute, excelled. He's a poet. He's been in heaven now for a while, and I had a privilege of spending three days at a conference uh, where he was speaking, and there wasn't but maybe, maybe 30, 40 preachers there. And so we had a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with him, and, and, and you got to appreciate him. But in that message, getting used to the dark, he, he told he had, prayed, had a revival meeting, and the preacher took him out to eat, and he went to an Italian restaurant. He'd never been to an Italian restaurant. And said, first thing, he said, I had trouble finding the table. He said, it was dark. And he said, lit one little old candle on the table. He said, I couldn't even read the menu. He said, but you know, the longer we stayed in there, the more I could see. I began getting used to the dark. I think that's where the church is today. I think we've gotten used to the dark. And when a bright light comes, it hurts her eyes. And sometimes we'd say, cut that light off. When we really should be saying, cut the light on. And so whenever we begin to see where things are, especially, we know, we know these wars going in the heavens. We, we know that's there. But then does God leave us defenseless? Now, please, as we get a little further, let me show you verse 30. And, and this is still in Acts 17. Look what he says in verse 30. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. So that leads me to know that God's been patient with me. He allows us to grow up. 
But after a while, he'll say, it's time for you to get up and walk. I'm tired of carrying you. And then, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And boy, is that ever big. Verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day. That's a wow. He has got a day appointed. And we're closer to it than when we first believed. Here's that day. In the which he will judge the world in righteousness that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Look what he did. Look what he made possible. I mean at this point we can just you know, maybe we'll take a lap and say God you did. You did. Now let's bring this Maybe a little more full circle. And you'll see these verses in the handout. Galatians 3.26. And, and uh, notice what he says. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And that's the only way in. There's no other way in the kingdom than faith. And then verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have, have put on Christ. Now the baptism here. Is not solely a water baptism. It's not. That's not. That's that's bending the context. Um, whenever you're baptized, there's a word that we use to identify our mode of baptism. Can you tell me what that is? As Baptists, how do we baptize? Full immersion. Immersion. Totally under. When we totally surrender him, to Him. Now some call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But, the, but the, there's, that, there's that moment when we really come face to face with, mate, my life is no longer mine. It's his. I'm redeemed. He's purchased me. And you see, the repentance preceded this in Paul's writing earlier in 9 Galatians. We see it. Now, look with me just a little bit further. Look at verse 28. He says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. But you're all one in Christ Jesus. So we share that. That's common ground. That's common for all of us. And so we really don't have anything to brag about, do we? And then in verse 29, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham, Abram's, Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, that's just background. Let's look at a couple of things in this. You should see, I believe, in your, in your handout. And uh, let me see if I, if you don't see the paragraph, we will try to help find that for you. You know, Pastor, uh, verse 29 is, is really big. Okay. Yeah, okay. That is really big because that, that puts us, shows us that we are part of, Abraham's seed and heirs. The court of the promise. According to the promise. Yeah. And it's, it's not, um, what do they call it? Uh, uh, it's not that we, we are, 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 are taking over uh, Abraham. What do they call it? We're not, we're not replacing it. No, right. Replacing no, no, no. We, we are we, part of. Oh, yeah, we, we're, we're grafted in. We're in the family. It's, it's all. A, it's, it's just, it's a sealed issue, and so yes, you're right, Paul. So let's look at a couple of things that I think can help us identify some terms. Now that we know who we are, what God's done for us, what He did, and you'll see this. I'm on page one of your handout, and at the beginning of that page, we see Paul quite clearly alludes to the situation where the nations produced by God's judgment at Babel, and then he recites Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9, and then God has, has disinherited the nations as his people and made a new people for himself, and that's Israel. That's where the call of Abraham comes in. His own portion, you see it again in Deuteronomy 32, 9, and immediately after the judgment at Babel, and that's Genesis 11, 1 through 9, God called Abraham for that purpose, initiating a covenant relationship with Abraham and his yet unborn descendants. 
Now, now when, when you, when you, you just take that bit of a paragraph, paragraph and, uh, and uh, if I, I put word up, I think, I think, well, let me, let me get this back out of the way for a second, and I think we can see it on, on the screen. See right here, I got, I got this statement highlighted in yellow. And, and then you, you see what we just talked about, that covenant relationship is coming up in that next paragraph. And then if you'll notice the last statement that's highlighted uh, on the screen there, Paul's rationale for his own ministry to the Gentiles was that it was God's intention to reclaim the nations, to restore the original Enoch vision, meaning uh, that that he started the Garden of Eden, God was going to restore. We've talked about this almost every class, especially beginning of the year, that what God did in the Garden of Eden, we know it's going to finish up. In the New Jerusalem, New Heaven, New Earth. I mean, it's going to be back in the perfect, perfect state it was in. Otherwise, Satan would win. So here, you, you got that reaffirmed. And this little handout, all these, maybe two pages. It's not, this isn't a book that you'd have to memorize. But, oh boy, you can get a lot of good, good stuff. And then if you'll go with me a little bit further, we're going to touch on some, some of the uh, uh, note, footnotes that's on this, this page. Look at, look at uh, the next statement. It says, every person in every nation was given the opportunity to repent and believe in the risen Christ. That's Acts 17.30. When I was reading that a moment ago to you, he, he, he dealt with all the gender. He dealt with all the nationalities. And notice what he says. Every person. And every nation was given the opportunity to repent. That reads a lot like Romans, the first chapter. That uh, they, uh, mankind's without excuse. Because God's revealed even the Godhead and nature and, and other areas. And then if you notice the statement, salvation was not only for the physical children of Abraham, but for everyone who would believe. And that takes us back to Galatians 3, 26 through 29. Now, we're going to see a footnote coming up in just a moment, and I think it's going to continue on my page two. And uh, let me see where it is. It's on your page at the bottom of the page. You see at the bottom of the page, uh, oh, yeah, you do. No, you don't. Let me go a little bit further. So I don't, I'm trying to keep this in order, but I don't know that I can. Let's look right here. More pointedly. Uh, we're, uh, I broke a page. It's, it's toward the bottom of the paragraph. Uh, above principality pow uh, powers and powers again and dom dominions and thrones. And then you see the, the term most pointedly. Paul's terminology of the powers of darkness reflect the cosmic ge geographical worldview arising from Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9. The Hebrew word for prince used throughout Daniel 10 is sar, S-A-R. In Daniel 10, 13, when Michael is called one of the chief princes. The Septuagint refers to Michael as one of the chief, and I don't know if I'm going to get my Greek to work well, Archonton, Archonton, in, in describing the rulers of this age, and you got it again in 1 Corinthians 2, 6, and 8, where you see the rulers of this age, the rulers in heavenly places, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, and the rulers of the authority of the air, Ephesians 2, 2. So whenever we begin to talk about these things, and we, we mentioned we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, in this study, I've sought to produce for you in context, and, and, and this is taken from, from the studies that you have, but to highlight for you a practical understanding of some of the things that we're facing and, and understand that, it, that this isn't something just made up, for example, there's some arguments against Michael Heiser, who led the way in these, in this, these teachings. They want to say that it's his opinion. Well, Heiser just makes this comment, that in all the books he's written, he's never put in one of his ideas, except maybe in, uh, the only place I've ever seen it, is his view on, on the return of Christ or eschatology with Armageddon, and, and that would be an observation. But here, he's just saying, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Word says in, in, in the Greek or in the Hebrew. And then if you'll notice the terms that are going to be surfacing, uh, he, he points out Paul often interchanged these terms with others 
that are familiar to most Bible students. And there's where you see principalities, you see the Greek. The powers or authorities, you see the Greek. You see powers, dynamis, again the Greek. Dominions, lords, Chris, Chris, and then thrones. So you see what, you see the Greek, and then you can begin to see uh, as he will deal with some of these words specifically, how they apply. Uh, notice, under the, 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 the four or five terms we have, these terms have sometimes have some things in common. They were used in both the New Testament and other Greek literature for geographical domain rela uh, rulerships. They just stop right there for a moment. You see, some of the commentaries and the popular thought when I was in school and most of my books allude to if you go back to Genesis 6 and you accept the premise that the sons of God were the descendants of Seth then who are these rulers who are these authorities who are these principalities are they earthly rulers if so, you got a problem with Genesis, uh, with Ephesians 6 that says we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. So we're not talking about man. We're talking about a spirit world. And if it's a spirit world, how are we going to deal with it if we don't even admit it? If we don't even acknowledge it? And so here's where I believe that Paul was opening the door for us to begin to see and this was his, if you remember that statement I shared with you from Acts 26, this was a foundation of Paul's theological view that there is that unseen world out there and how it fits. And so it, it is, I promise, it's helped me. And I hope it helps you, especially in my prayer life. Now, and let me say this too, and I meant to do it early and I hadn't. The book of Hebrews addresses in, I think, the most, most depth. In, in, in the book of Hebrews, there was a problem. And the problem was a worship of angels. Now, there's some things we can look at that might help us have some understanding why maybe some of our, our Protestant or evangelical forefathers didn't put a lot of emphasis on angels. One of which would be man's tendency to worship them. And it's pretty common today there's been a resurgence of angel worship. And uh, it's mostly in the New Age movement, not, you know, it's not in the church, but it, it's in an occultic atmosphere because it's something that Satan likes to hijack. But, for example, I'm going to sneeze. I can't sneeze. I might lose another eye. <laughs> vessel but anyway in Jerusalem we've been there a few times but usually we're on a, in a hurry we go to David's tomb the upper room leave it go back to Zion's gate there's there's this cathedral this church is, is the round one in it there is on display a statue of Mary in 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 a deceased position. It's, it's like she's dead. And lots and lots of people will go in and worship Mary and pray to Mary. And, and Mary, you know, was flesh and blood like we are. But they deified. And those of you with a Catholic background, you know much more here than I do and how that can slip over. And yet we, we have people uh, who who have to have something maybe is the best way I know to say it it's an addition to the word of God it's an addition to their faith but they want to have something more on the tangible side and if you stop and think about this for a moment we're saved by faith we live by faith we got to die in the faith it's not something on this earth that God says you got to have something tangible if he had he'd give it to us and so we just got to claim his promises and believe them now, having said that, if you look with me at the bottom of this page, we're going we're gonna to unwrap something. There's a footnote here, and I want you to just look at it on your paper because I'm not sure where it's going to come up. Uh, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. Here it is right here. Right here. Recall 
the Septuagint. Now, what is that? Seventy, I think seventy-two, seventy scholars got together in Cairo or Alexandria, and they copied the Hebrew manuscripts into the Greek. And and this became so popular in Jesus' day. The 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 studies were being done in this Greek text, not the ancient Hebrew. Now to explain that all I can't. But in this article you'll see what he says here. Recall that the Septuagint is, is ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament. It was heavily used by the New Testament writers since the New Testament was composed in Greek. The majority of the quotations of the Old Testament by New Testament writers reflect the Septuagint, not the traditional Hebrew text. And we're talking about the, 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 new, the writers. So if they were looking at that text as a source, and then we've come along, and largely what people want to go back and depend on will be the oldest Hebrew text. But interestingly, this, this text predates. It, it's older than the oldest manuscripts that we find in the Hebrew. And, and, and that's where the difference is. For example, you've got certain words translated in this translation a certain way and another translation another way. But since the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, we have Bible translations based on it. And that's where the, the ESV comes in. But when they translated it, they used the Greek. And therefore, they, the terminology, the sons of God, the sons of Elohim that we talk about, and, and he's amplifying on this in, in this verse. So if someone is just, you know, if we just <clears throat> blindly accept something without doing any study on our own, it can sometimes get us backed into a corner. But um, look with me. Let's see, where did it leave off? We got to, uh, I want to get back to, the, he, he talks in... Uh, these terms have sometimes have, have some things in common, and this is that geographical relationship. We have to keep that in mind. Where did it happen? Who was there? And then we want to look, look for what was said. He says, this is a divine dominion <coughs> concept. We mentioned that. Look in the next paragraph. The first three terms are found in Ephesians 6.12. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world rulers of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in what kind of places? Heavenly places. Now, if they're in heavenly places, what does that mean? Does that mean they're here on earth? Nope. Or heavenly places. So we kind of know who their origin is. We see where they're, they're, you know, they're addressed. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, 20 through 21, that when God raised Jesus from the dead, he seated him at his right hand in heavenly places far above what? All rule and authority and power and dominion. And that's taken from the ESV. It was only after Christ had risen that God's plan was made known. And that's big. Only after he was raised from the dead that his plan was made big. You remember we've talked about this? Had the angels known? Had Satan known? He wouldn't have crucified Jesus? I mean, they thought, I mean, they were riding high until that third day. I mean, the day of the crucifixion, can't you imagine what was going on in the outer darkness down in the pits and the celebrating was going on because they thought they'd won? They've killed the Son of God? And then you got the second day, but then on that third day, up from the grave, he arose. And when he did, his resurrection condemned every aspect of spiritual darkness. He's not executed yet, that's coming. He says, that's coming. But he, the condemnation happened at the resurrection. So you got verses in this little handout that give you a good mile marker, a good tag. Now, look with me, the next paragraph, see it all links. The incident at Babel and God's decision to disinherit the nations drew up the battle lines for a, for a cosmic turf war for the planet. The corruption of the Elohim sons of God set over the nations 
meant that Yahweh's vision of a global Eden would be met with divine force. Every inch outside Israel would be contested. And that's why God said, this is my land now. This is my, this is my inheritance. Israel, this is mine. But you can see how, do we not see that happening today? Oh, yeah. Where, where the gospel is being contested. And then if you go a little bit further, look, look what he says next. He says, every inch outside Israel will be, will be contested, and Israel itself was fair game for the hostile conquest. The gods would not surrender their inheritance back to Yahweh. He would have to reclaim them. God would have to take, uh, take the first step in that campaign immediately after Babel. And so that little handout that I've given you, uh, it may not look like a lot, page and a half or so, as we've got it printed out, but I promise, isn't it? It doesn't have, you know, 500 verses in it. But if you will go back, see context, begin to understand God did do something, that there is this allocation, there are these boundaries, there are these borders that God established. And if you tie this in to Psalms 82, which I didn't put in here, Psalms 82 is where he stands in the congregation, in that divine assembly, and he brings the charges against the gods. And that's where he says about verse 6, you'll die like men. And so to die like a man means you must not be a man. You've got to be something besides a man. But this, this, this death sentence that God places on these who I believe were rulers. Uh, you know, this cosmic and cosmos ideas to me is kind of like Star Trek. I, you know, I never really thought in, in those particular terms. But the more I've read and studied and done some parallel studies, it's more of an academic terminology and it, that's used largely in theology, astronomy, and these other areas where, where there is the science that they're studying, then the definitions are more meaningful in that context. So I hope this first study, I, I didn't finish it, but uh, I mean, I did tonight, but I, I, I wanted to, to, to take you there. And then I want to go back to what we started last week and have you look at this with me on three ways angels participate in the heavenly council. So they're, they're the four handouts, and we've completed the first one. And now I want to just, just see how much time we got. We good? On time. Yeah, we got a little bit of time. Now, look at this for a moment. I mentioned this last. A guest author wrote this. And uh, he, he's going to quote from Heiser's Angels book, which I think we got. Is there one book left? And then I think we got a couple copies of Mount Hermon and a few more of the... the, the um, uh, I can lose something in a hurry. Here it is. Put something over it and it's not the supernatural. And this is a great little book. It's compact. Now, let's look at this for a bit. You tired? Okay. He, he, I mentioned this. I'm going to review lightly because I want to get a little bit further. In previous posts, we drew from Michael Heiser's angels to find out what the Bible tells about angels. We know that the angels are immaterial members of God's heavenly host. And we also discussed why Christians should care about angelology in the first place. And then if you'll go on down, I'm not going to read all of the article, but I want to get down to that first point because we got that far last week. And then if you'll look at this, we see angels make decisions. Last week we saw in 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23, the prophet... Micaiah, and his re he, he reports a vision that is, a stra is strange to me. But, you know, that's where the God brought up uh, Ahab and what we're going to do about him. And, and he was to die, and how is he going to die? And this council that he has. We, we don't know how many members make up the council. There are a lot of different opinions because it's something that, that God hadn't completely revealed to us. But we do know that there was the one. And here in the middle of that verse, you'll see, And one said one thing and one another. Then a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, By what means? And he said, I will go out, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And so here, if there's a lesson to learn, we better send word to Donald Trump. 
to be careful who he listens to. Because we see what, what what's going on here. But, you know, sometimes we get advice and it doesn't work out so good. Maybe it was because the lying spirit got in the mouth of the one that was talking to us to get us sidetracked. But then he goes on to say, and then he said, you are to entice him and you, and you shall succeed. And we knew he did, and we know that was Ahab's testimony. That's what happened. And then if you go a little bit further, uh, the second point is angels bear witness. Look at this with me now. Now, bear witness of what? Uh, scripture shows the council witnessing and affirming Yahweh's decrees in various settings. The first one in creation, Job 38, 4 through 7. And God brings this to Job's attention. And, and so angels witness what he's done and, and what he's doing. Second point, the decision to create humanity. Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man in our image. There was a conversation. Now some say that it was a conversation in the Trinity. But you see, us is kind of confusing. How many compose the Trinity? Three? Are they Separate entities? Yep. Just one. Just one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is one. We see three aspects. And, and, and I don't explain it. I know I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, a pastor. I got a lot of titles. But I'm just one person. God's only one. And, 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 and sometimes I think we can, I, I've confused myself over some things, but this one, uh, you know, I always wondered about the let us, who's he talking to? And, and so if there is a divine council, if there is this, this, this assembly, this congregation in Psalms 82 that God created, and if there, there are the Elohim, they're little gods, they're not big gods, and they're angels, we talked about that a little bit, I think, last week as well, then we can begin to see some of the framework. Look at the third point, the giving of the law. You see this in Acts 7, 53, in Galatians 3, 19, Hebrews 2, 2. The angels. And then verdicts, Amos 9, uh, 3, 9 through 14. Angels bringing a verdict. And then rule from exile, Isaiah 41 through 2. And then the commissioning of, of, of prophets in Isaiah 6. And, and you also see it in Jeremiah 23, 16 through 22. So what does that mean? Well, it kind of tells me that, one, God's got a plan. God's got a purpose. God's got it all worked out. And you know, there's a bumper stick, what does it say? It says, uh, God's word is true. I, Oh, I believe it and it settles it. God said, I believe it. Yeah, yeah God said it, it, I believe it, it settles it. It's settled whether you believe it or not. I mean, you, you don't have to put that on the end of it. So when God put things in place, now let me give you one to think about. Now you think about this tonight. We have another session for this semester, but follow me for a moment. And, and, and Corinthians, where the Bible says, I think it's sixth chapter, says we'll judge angels. No, you're not, we'll judge angels. We know, we know that that's not an earthly realm thing. That's not here. So that's got to be a future thing. You agree on it? Why would you need a judge? I couldn't quite hear you, Shirley. In other words, there's something going on. Now, we see heaven as a perfect place. I guess maybe we should find some comfort in the fact that the Bible doesn't say in heaven we judge each other. Yeah. But he says angels. So, you know, so maybe they hadn't had the glorified that we had. But it leads you to know that God has given them a free will. We'll have a free will. And it's with our free will he wants us to love him. 
He'll never, never be a dictator. We got to choose him. And it sure is good to get in practice here, isn't it? Amen. That we know what that what that means. But uh, so here we see some things uh, that he outlines for us: the commissioning of the prophets, the return from the exile, verdicts, uh, and then we got that second point is the bearing witness, and then there is one following. And that third point is angels govern the world. I want to get there because that's fitting into what we've done so far. Angels govern the world. The council also participates in overseeing the human world. Job chapter 1 and 2. Council members present themselves before Yahweh, before God. You see that in Job chapter 1 verses 6 through 12. Amongst them, the Satan has been traveling to and fro on the earth, Job 1.7, Zechariah 1.10, describes a similar instance where angels patrol the earth and report back to Yahweh. Makes me want to say, God have mercy on me. You know, sometimes we think we're alone. You know, we can get our little pity trips going. We can get get our feelings hurt. In fact, I'm going to inject a prayer request, but don't I'll forget it. The final papers, all the invoices have been submitted to the insurance company. They've had it 10 days, maybe two weeks. Last Sunday night, I woke up Monday morning, woke up in the middle of the night with a burden. So first thing I did Monday morning was call the office and I told Karen, I said, put the house on the prayer chain and have people pray about this insurance settlement. Well, we waited Monday, no call, no Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, Karen's calling me, have you heard anything? I said, no, have you heard anything? No. Now, we're talking about... We're talking about a, a substantial amount of money spent in lieu of being reimbursed. I think it's about $60,000. I'm not sure. I know what I've put in. Well, on Friday, Karen got a call. The person handling the claim with the insurance company is no longer with them. Now, you talk about irony. Now just, we're talking about powers and principalities, so it's in context. The person that handled the personal effects policy that I had got sick, was out of work, and the replacement never followed up. And so, but I did, I did come out comfortable, not happy, but comfortable on that settlement. Because all state just paid me the balance of what I had in the personal effects. I had paid for the cleaning that didn't get cleaned and the laundry that didn't get back. The laundry was $11,000 and to pack up the stuff and carry it away was 27000 And so then I had to pay another 3000 to get it out of storage because the time had lapsed. So that was the first round. The two primary adjusters with the third party company that we hired to arbitrate for us, to represent us, and that's legal as well as the construction stuff. The two, the two, the attorney who was to do it and the chief adjuster both left the company. That second start over. And now the guy with the insurance company, now the, the replacement, we've been working two or three months with the person who took the place of those that left. And, and had to recreate all of it. I mean, I mean, they just, this person just looked at the papers, you know, hadn't been in the conversations. And now we're dealing with a similar situation with the insurance company. But to God be the glory. You know, you could, you could let this rain on your parade if you want to. And boy, there's temptation. But God knows. And one day maybe I can write a book. Because...
That's what Karen told me Friday. She sent me, she sent me a, a text. She said, we need to write a book. Because she's been in the middle of all this. Everything we've done, she's handled. I, I've not handled any of the money. None of every, every bit of it went through, through Karen at the church. But anyway, I do believe there are powers and principalities. I mean, I, I do. And I mean, whatever reason, whether we individually, we as a church, you as a family, you, have some, you get in a storm, you attracted somebody's attention. When Heather was so sick, Africa, I sent word to her, you made the devil mad. And she's getting healthier. But, you know, if you, you get to a certain place, you can, the devil's going to see what you made out of. And it, it just, I've wrestled out a good bit. I mean, I can't lose what I've got over this when I might fly. Wouldn't it be something? You get mad, have a bench, you fit and snot and scream and slobber and carry on. And the next minute, the rapture takes place. And you finishing that conversation with the Lord? No, 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 no. We just have to, we just have to hang on. But look at this. The angels. Well, the key to all of it is the fact we have a free will. We're not robots. And we, we have that choice. We can, we can turn it to the glory of God. And I do believe God restores that the locust steals. And so we just got to believe God to, to do it. But if you look with me in these, this third point, the angels govern the world. You, you see the references, especially in Job. You sit in Zechariah. And then if you go down to that next paragraph, you see, you notice in our study how many times we're seeing this Deuteronomy 32 come up? And look at, look at that next paragraph. In addition, members of the council appear to have been given administration of the nations besides Israel. In an illuminating passage that contemplates Yahweh's judgment and the Tower of Babel incident, that we, that's in Matthew, that's in Genesis 10, 25, but it's Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9. And so when we look at this, he goes on to say, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, but the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. And then that next statement says, these verses tell us that when Yahweh divided the nations, and that's Genesis Again, 10 and 11, he delegated their oversight to other council members. Now, here's a contrast. In contrast, as we see in the call of Abraham in Genesis 12, Israel was directly governed by Yahweh himself. However, at some point, these beings abused their commission. Psalms 82 describes a scene where Yahweh calls the sons of God into account for their abuse and mismanagement of the nations. Now, look with me just in this next statement. God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. He holds judgment. How long you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked. That's Psalms 82, 1 and 2. I said, your God, son of the Most High, all of you, nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. And that takes us on through verses 6 through 8. Now, this psalm holds out hope that these sons of God will be judged for deceiving the nations. When we connect these dots, we see how high-level angelic beings could be called the princes of Persia, Daniel 10, 13. Greece, Daniel 10, 30, 20. Paul references to the principalities and powers as in Ephesians six twelve, and this would become or should become clearer. Now, I hope that this will help you have a little more perspective on how all these pieces fit, because we've studied Psalms 82 alone, we've studied Deuteronomy 32 alone, we've, we've looked at other references, and, and we've done Genesis, the sixth chapter, 
and, and as the sons of God, daughters of men, we've looked at all those all those areas enough that by now you're probably, as I have gotten, somewhat comfortable with the terms. But how does it work? These three points that he brings out about angels has given me one of the best simple understandings of how God has things placed in, 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 his, in his cosmos, his cosmic view. Now, let's note the conclusion. In addition to carrying out Yahweh's commands and worshiping him, angels also participate in his counsel. They contribute to the who and how of decisions and missions. God bears witness to and affirms his decrees and, 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 and govern the nations. Next paragraph. That said, heavenly beings are not autonomous. Whoa, look at this now. That said, heavenly beings are not autonomous. Rather, as Heiser says, they are like us, do not act autonomously, but God does indeed expect us and them to serve as his representatives utilizing the abilities he has bestowed. So if an angel visited you, wouldn't you, wouldn't you want to know who sent him? You remember Jericho? Joshua asked one, who sent you? Whose side you want? Now, if God can send angels, can Satan send demons? Yep. And demons are angels of light. They masquerade. And how many times do you suppose we have surrendered our will to evil and not to good because we didn't discern the spirit and for the most part it wasn't on my horizon you know I, I, I wasn't pre-programmed until here late in life to see it notice this last statement angels are not floating around in heaven with nothing to do but sing and shoot arrows they serve important functions in God's ultimate rule over the cosmos now here's the go home thought if they do and one day we will judge angels as Paul's words no you not that if if we can get an idea of what angels are, they serve important functions in God's ultimate rule well that means we're going to serve a more important function in God's ultimate rule so on Sunday in the message in Colossians 2 9 that in him in Jesus was all of the Godhead bodily so whenever you and I receive Christ as our Savior we got all of God the Father we got all of God the Holy Spirit and we got all of God the Son greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world now if we sign up in his service don't you suppose that he has already had a plan in place to equip us that spiritual gifts to use us that's a spiritual calling and that he also has a place of service for us and that that we do down here I believe will be multiplied up there if we do little here probably just a mundane job up there but if we're faithful here, we're mu if we're faithful, I believe much will be given. And so our futures are a lot brighter there when we understand what he's prepared us for. And I don't know about you, but it just sets me on fire. Amen. Yes, ma'am. We should. We should. We should. We should. We have authority. We have power. In his word, in his name, the blood. You know, there's a lot we have, but the problem is that if we are entertaining those unawares, for example, he said we entertain angels unawares, good angels unawares. But at the same time, we may entertain demons unawares. 
And we really have to be, you know, we have to be listening carefully. Because some of the, some of are masters of disguise. And, and they seek to win our confidence. But usually, uh, in my experience, it doesn't take long. And you say, whoa, whoa, you know, this isn't it. And you test the spirit then and then resist it and, 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 and get the victory. But think of, think of the number of young people, best friends, come along and, and, and just mess them up. That's where my best friend put the first alcoholic beverage in my hand. Best friend, athlete, looked up to him, older. Said, go ahead, show me a man. Strangers don't rob our youth of their virtue. It's their friends. And, and, and I don't know how prepared we're. This nothing convicts me about spiritual warfare. Is, is how thorough are we in preparing our young people for the battles that they have. But now when I came along, I was in, I was in high school. They're facing that in middle school and younger. Uh, I mean, it's, it's open season. And uh, I, another thing I've learned, and you're going to hear some of this, it might be on this, on this Judicial Watch video, but one of them is bringing up something. There's, there's a common denominator in much of the uh, deep state. How much time we got? And uh, I won't go to another study. I'm going to kind of... Yes, ma'am. Sure, we, we can do that. Yes. Don't think that would have been at the tower. There, there's a lot of speculation. I mean, you've got you've got the three sons of Noah, and then but but uh, you know there there's a blem on two of the three, and that's why Seth is referred to as being righteous. Uh, really, there is a lot of debate as to where, uh, you know, the. I, I think that ultimately through DNA and the genetics that they're going to figure that out. But I've not seen anything published. I don't think that that was, I don't think that was in the division in Genesis 10. Now, the consequence of the division, because you got, you, 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 everybody, I mean, you got the brown, you got the yellow, you got uh, the black, you got brown, you got so many. And, and that's where I think that that's going to surface maybe from a genetic standpoint more so than it would have been then. I think he just, he, he confounded them, he gave them a different language, and then those that spoke the same language, that was a unifier. But then Nimrod was running rampant, and he's the first type of Antichrist. And, and so uh, I have been doing some study in that end, and to be honest, it's about as deep as anything I've looked at so far, but pretty simple. Uh, and, and I'm going to try to get the mythology that predated Babylon. Uh, you got the, 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 all the findings from language on that they found that predates all of the languages and the worship and the gods and, the, and so forth. And all of them have a common denominator. So you see the similar things in Greece, similar things in, in uh, also in Egypt. You see in, in India, we have so many pagan gods. And then certainly over towards China. Yes, Brother Walter. What now? Oh, well, what they, what they were talking about is that in this deep state, and it's, this is really, and I can't tell you exactly where I heard it, but I heard it. And uh, I should have, I didn't have a chance to, to jot it down. But uh, we are overrun by pedophilia in the elite 
population of our world. In the highest echelons across the world. And they're linking some of the things that, you know, what unites these people. You know, for example, of what would lead a person. Let's just, just, just say, for example, the Republican after Trump was elected. I mean, why wasn't that all we needed? They had the majority of the House, the Senate. I mean, why would they even debate on things that the most had campaigned on, especially about health care? That should have been automatic. And then, I mean, Trump. I mean, Trump wasn't even sworn in, and the plans were already in place to get him impeached. And, and you had a number of Republicans who were never Trumpers. Never Trumpers. And so that alone should give you a pretty good due north on your compass as to the challenge. And then in this election, uh, listen, if it goes the way they project by some uh, in the House, Nancy Pelosi could be the speaker. Maxine Waters would serve in a high cabinet position, a high committee position. Nadler would be the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. And, and uh, I mean, that's how delicate it is. Well, you know, we, we survived times in the past that looked pretty dark. But I, I believe God has his hand on things that we just can't see. And some things, I guess he won't even, it's not totally up to us. It's up to him. And so we really need to be praying. Yes, Harvey. Right. 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 Oh, yeah. Well, so that's that Judicial Watch video that I was referring to earlier. That uh, you can go as a deep state update. And I, I, I've seen a good many. I've had a lot of people refer them to me. But they're, they're, here's a problem. Let me see this now. If you go on YouTube or somewhere and you try to do some of these searches, I have confidence in Judicial Watch. And the prophecy guy would be a good man. There's some people that I know enough about that I say, hey, you know, this guy's pretty straight. But when I watch that Judicial Watch video, knowing who they are and what they have fought for and won it in the courts, uh, I said, you know, I'm going to listen to it. And the more I listened, the more spellbound I became. But there is an agenda. Well, he's on, he's present right hand. I mean, he's guiding him through this minefield while he's been there. But... Uh, well, we're going to try to, after Jubilee, of course, next week we got to vote here. That would mess us up, and then Jubilee. But we'll come back one more session in November. Next two, we, we, well, maybe, let's see how, how we feel during Jubilee. If, you, if you're not worn out, we could come back to Tuesday after Jubilee and, and, and do it then. Because the further we go, you see, th there's a scale. Whenever you go so far... And we had that long interruption through the flood. And then you, you, people get other things going on, and it's hard to, you know, to keep that momentum going. And so we'll, we'll, we'll try to – got more study that we hadn't touched yet. It's much of the handouts I've given you we want to finish going through. But um, let's pray for Jubilee. Let's pray for sick in the church family. Pray for Julia Goins. Her husband Dave passed away, and we want to be, be holding her up in her prayers. Uh, and then uh, Natalie uh, had a uh, Brian had a had a, another seizure, and she's at MUSC, and I've not heard today how she's doing. So Sharon, I think family went down with her. I think so. I think Libby posted something yeah, on, on, on her. Hadn't heard yet. They said it would. The, the, the family is out of town for the big part. But what I understood, it's going to be a, a later date announced. So I don't know, you know, whether it's this weekend or when. But uh, 
I have not heard on, on, on the date. Okay. Well, if you had as much fun as I've had, uh, I, I have enjoyed this semester, even though we got interruptions. And, and uh, uh, But the thing that has been helping me more than anything is that you have to get to your comfort zone. And I was never a person who in Bible study or even preaching could wear somebody else's shoes. I mean, I got to wear them enough to break them in. And when I put these shoes on, they hurt my feet, I can promise you. And it took a while to get to it, but the more familiar that you're becoming with the terms and then the worldview, and begin to see only logic says that there are things we can't see. And we know from the scriptures Angels have responsibilities, and we hadn't even touched the surface. I mean, they proclaimed the birth of Christ. You got there's so many things that angels carried the message. So let's pray, Heavenly Father. Thank you for tonight, and Lord, we just pray you'd bless us as we get into the countdown for Jubilee. I do think of the sick. Pray for young Cameron, brother Jim's son-in-law. We just pray you'd strengthen his body, enable him to drink to eat, heal his esophagus where they've used that radiation and we pray you'd comfort Julia. Uh, we pray Father that you would be with Jack Barnhill and Brother Dave Burkhart that their problems can be solved and, and find the solution. Pray for Natalie. Pray for Sharon family and travels to Charleston. And then we do pray for each who may be near a death point or being removed from ventilators I pray I pray for our dear Chinese friend I can't imagine Lord living with a 30 some pound tumor but Lord that glory on her face that joy she shared and we just pray I told her she had found a new family here and I know she has a new family in heaven. So we pray you'd bless her. Pray for her healing. And the healing of all those that are on our heart, spoken and unspoken. In Christ's name we ask. Amen.